Can everyone hear me? Well, thank you very much for coming. I want to talk today about authentication and authorization in the context of uh, browser applications. And a lot of the things that I will say, they, uh, a lot of those things I think are obvious sometimes to people when they, in the server context. But when you move this, uh, a lot of logic to the browser, I, I see that a lot of people get lost in terms of where exactly uh, the responsibility should fall between the browser and the server. Before I talk more about it, I just want to clarify the distinction between authentication and authorization, which, again, uh, is relatively straightforward, but just important to be on the same page about this. Right? So for the purpose of this talk, by authentication, we mean uh, establishing who the user is. And by authorization, we mean establishing what is it that they're actually allowed or not allowed to do. Now, the reason this distinction is important, because what I find is that oftentimes people actually remember, it's, it's virtually impossible to forget about authentication. But it's actually surprisingly easy to forget about, to forget about doing authorization properly. So, this distinct, so I, consequently, I will actually spend more time today talking about authorization than about authentication, because authentication kind of tends to fall in place relatively naturally. So why do we need to worry about this? Right? It's primarily to protect our clients from outsiders. And that's the first thing that comes to mind, right? is we want to protect our clients from some sort of malicious hackers. But equally important, and perhaps in some cases a lot more important, is we want to protect our clients from each other. Because just the fact that someone is an authenticated user of a system doesn't mean that they get to see everything. Right? If I have an account with CIBC and you have an account with CIBC, this doesn't mean that I ought to be able to see your account information. Right? I mean, this again is sort of, I think, sometimes easily forgotten. And then finally, it's also important to protect clients from themselves, which is to say that if certain things have been designated by a client earlier by some business logic really should not be, say, deletable by this client, even though it belongs to them, we want to be able to uh, prevent them from doing that, even if they actually choose to do that. But again, the focus of today's talk will really be on the sort of middle piece of protecting clients from each other, because this is the piece that is almost, al uh, is almost always very important. And at the same time, it is actually kind of easy to, uh, to not think through that properly. So to kind of talk about where does the responsibilities fall, I kind of want to look at, uh, go through just a little bit of history. So let's go back about 15 years. And 15 years ago, the way the responsibilities would fall uh, between the server and the client would be roughly like this, right? Where the server does basically everything. The server is responsible for storage. It's responsible for business logic, which is sort of transforming the data. Uh, it's responsible for authentication and authorization. And it's even doing interaction logic. And the client is really doing not much more than displaying the data and capturing user events like clicks and text entry. Now, the first thing that, of course, had to go is we realized that user experience could be a lot better if we actually move interaction logic to the client because we get snappier performance. It could be a lot, it can look a lot better. The next thing after that, um, I mean, this really, this today, there's very little, arg there's very little. Um, reason to put uh, interaction logic on the server. Now, the next thing is we start thinking about putting business logic on the client. Now, this turns out to be a little trickier in the sense that we can't really move all business logic to the client. Um, practically, what we often do today was, is we split it. We do some business logic on the server, some business logic on the client. Um, how we split it is a sort of a separate a topic for a separate day. But now, what about Authentication. Well, with authentication, I really, so I think it's fairly obvious, and I don't want to get into much into this, but we can't really do authentication fully on the client. The reason for it is because we can't trust the client. I mean, doing authentication on the client essentially comes down to trusting the client to just tell us who, who they are. Now, a common solution that has emerged, though, is to not, as an alternative to doing, doing authentication on the server is to do authentication on a, third, on a trusted third party. So in this case, we might you rely on, say, um, maybe Facebook or Google. And this is a really popular approach. And I will um, focus this talk on this approach. Though, of course, the doing authentication on the server side is still an option. Now, what about authorization? Well, quite 
can we do authorization? Can we rely on the third party for authorization? Well, no, that really makes no sense, right? Because we can trust Google to tell us who a particular person is, but we can't really expect Google to tell us what the users are, not even because we don't trust Google, but because Google doesn't even know what, are, what is the range of different permissions that we would have. So that doesn't really make any sense, right? So what do we do then? Well, maybe we can move that to the client. If we move that to the client, the problem, we're now up against the same problem. We cannot trust the client. Tr um, doing, so doing authorization to the client essentially means that we're going to send the data to the client and we're going to say, you figure out whether you should be able to see that or not. Right? I mean, people do that. Right? So where basically your service sends a bunch of information and the client filters and says, oh, yeah, no, the user shouldn't be able to see this. Right? And equally, you, know, you, you go through the sort of your logic on the client side and say, oh, um, here we're going to disable the delete button uh, because the user should not be able to delete it. The problem with that approach is that all the user needs to do to actually gain improper uh, access is to use the console or keep in mind the user can always just go ahead and use an alternative client. I mean, they don't need to be using a browser in the first place and there's really little way for you to know whether they are actually using the browser, a particular browser or not. So you can't really do authorization on the client. So we move back to doing authorization on the server. But that presents us with a sort of unfortunate situation is that, well, the server, I mean, the authorization logic often needs to be bound fairly tightly with interaction logic. And if our authorization logic is on the server, what we often end, would end up with is that the user will make an action sort of hoping that it's going to succeed, and then they're going to get an ugly no from the server. So the solution ultimately becomes the following. We really need to have authorization logic in both places. And the way to distinguish them is I sort of mark them as the smiley face authorization and the frowny face authorization. Now, the frowny face authorization is the rude authorization. This is the server's approach. To it. This is good cop, bad cop approach. Right? So the server is the bad cop. The server, if, you, if the server gets a request, post this information. The server checks if you're supposed to be doing this, and it says no. Boom, you just got your, uh, your HTTP code back that says you're not allowed to do that. Now, the client-side authorization code is the good cop. It's, it's responsible for ensuring that you actually don't end up being led to think that you can do things that you're not going to be able to do later. Now, in this case, um, so ideally, the, so the question, so now importantly, I think that from the point of security, the sole responsibility of secu for security in that case is with the bad cop server-side authorization, which is to say that your client code should be written in such a way that there is no matter what the, no, what, no matter what mistakes you make in your client code, your users would still not be able to actually access, uh, do things that they are not authorized to do. The purpose of client-side authorization in this approach is basically courtesy. That's another way of calling it courtesy authorization. We are warning, that we are leading the client towards only performing action, only performing requests that actually are going to be, uh, are going to succeed. Now the question then becomes is how do you actually keep those things in sync? Now one approach is that each, uh, the server and the client both have their own separate logic that's a little disconnected. Um, where the server figures out whether you're supposed to be doing this and the client is supposed, so basically the, the server when getting a request for post checks if you actually are allowed to do and sends you a, uh, a rejection if you are not. The client uses its own logic to figure out whether you should actually be sending this request in the first place. This, however, leads easily to a disconnect in user experience where, again, because the two logics actually don't align, that your client sees the button that when, when clicked will cause an error. So a better approach is um, actually synchronize them by having the authorization context be shared by the server. So the server would figure out what is it that it actually um, Want, what is it that the user is actually allowed to do with specific resources 
send that information to the client, and then the client will actually make uh, client-side decisions involving interaction logic already using the information provided by the server. So in that sense, the ultimate decision is by the server, and the client essentially follows the server's lead. So let's talk now a little bit more specifically about doing this in the context of uh, the mean stack. Now, in, in the context of, um, and we'll be primarily taking a, a, a client-side uh, perspective here. So in the context of a server-side application, I mean, an application where everything happens on the server side, like good old um, HTML generation approach, when, the, when we get the request, the first question we ask of the client is we ask, who are you? Thinking about it from the client side, it kind of makes sense a little bit to think of it more like the first question, the first question you ask when you, when you wake up is, who am I? Because oftentimes what happens is the, um, so the client, so the, uh, the your JavaScript, your application gets sent to the client and when it wakes up, it needs to figure out which client is it rep does it represent. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that the ultimate answer to this question lies with the server. So you have to figure out in your application how to not just how to establish what who does the server think you are. Now, how do you do that? Uh, there's a few approaches. Uh, most of them would involve uh, either cookies or tokens. Um, Typically, um, you want to also know, to some extent, upfront who you are. So this is the first thing you ask when you, when you wake up. Um, a perhaps simplest approach to do that is when your application loads, it sends a request back to the server explicitly asking for uh, user uh, authentication information. A slightly faster and slightly better approach is that this information would be embedded already in, for instance, the HTML page itself. Now, from that point on, you have uh, options in terms of how to maintain, how to maintain, so you need to actually maintain, stay synchronized. The, the, your application does not get, um, with the server side, again, since the, like in the sort of an old school application, the interaction logic is on the server side, so the, it can be easily bound to the, to the uh, authentication set, uh, situation. In this case, we have to consciously maintain this. So there's a few ways to do that. So one approach is that you try to always stay logged in. So you need to make, you need, your server needs to let you know how long you are going to be authenticated for, and then you need to actually make sure that you're going to renew this if there's still user activity. Um, because notice that in a uh, browser application, it is fairly easy to end up in a situation where the user is actually doing lots of stuff, but there aren't requests sent back to the server, so the server may actually by now think that it's time to log you out. Right, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, so cookies versus tokens are two approaches for you to let know later um, the server who, uh, let, let, you, uh, let the server know who you are. And they kind of tend to be bound together with um, um, stateless versus st um, stateful setup for the server. So in the sort of more traditional setup, the server maintains a session, and your cookie basically identifies which session it is. Right? So in that case, every request to the server gets accompanied by a cookie, and the server thus knows who you are, and then it already knows that you already have been authenticated, and so it proceeds accordingly. Uh, the nice thing about tokens is that they allow you to potentially have a fully stateless server where the information about who you are and sort of is fully embedded in the token. Uh, in that case, also, um, potentially, you have an uh, advantage to the client as the client knows for how long they've got authorization and that really shouldn't go away suddenly. But at the same time, the downside is that uh, there's less flexibility on the server side because you can't actually kill sessions if you want to. So once you know, so again, the first question really ought to be is that your application needs to figure out if you are already authenticated. But now if you are not, how do you establish authentication with the server? Now if you're using mean stack, if you're going with Express, the standard solution today is Passport. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about Passport because, uh, I mean, it has excellent documentation and uh, it's really straightforward to set up, but I'll show you late, um, actually no, I won't. 
But the two strategies that are really most common uh, that you probably would want to be choosing between is a local strategy where you maintain a database where you keep your passwords, uh, your usernames and passwords. The only thing is, of course, you need to remember to absolutely need to remember to salt and hash your passwords. But short of that, uh, it's really straightforward. And then the second approach is social uh, OAuth, where you basically let your users log in with Facebook or Google or Twitter. Now, the second approach has an advantage from the point of view of um, the users who are on those systems and are willing to share this information with you will find it more convenient. Uh, you, have, you don't need to worry about validating the emails or not. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, some people may balk at this. Now, one thing also to keep in mind with an interesting difference between local and social authentication is that the, social authentic the local authentication can be done without actually restarting, the reloading the page. Right? What you could do is you could actually go ahead and send an AJAX request to the server, and the server authorizes you, and now you know that you're authorized and your page continues running. Uh, OAuth authentication takes you to the next page, and then you come back to your initial context. So you have to worry a little bit about actually making sure that you come back to the same thing so that your state is fully preserved in the URL. And also, this, so there's this extra reload. Now, uh, the plus side on the other hand there is that uh, in a way, this approach ends up being simpler because you often, in that case, can assume that if the user, when, that when you are logged in with a different user, essentially your application is gonna get reloaded anyway. So this is authentication. I mean, authentication, as I said, is fairly easy. The tricky part is authorization. The reason the authorization is more tricky is because authorization, there is just no application is really quite the same. Well, okay, maybe, not, maybe some are the same, but different applications have very different needs in terms of what type of rules, authorization rules, they need to support. So just Two probably most common strategies is authentication based on rules or activities where you basically just specify that a certain user is allowed to do certain things. Uh, so this user is a manager, this user is a, a supervisor, this user is a uh, technician, and so depending on that, they're allowed to do certain actions. Um, a common, way, so now one way to do that is to do it by role. Oftentimes, it ends up being a lot more flexible for you to do it by specific activities. So instead of associating users to roles and then just associating uh, and just leaving it at that, it would be often better for you to associate users to roles, roles to allowed activities, and then spe specify permissions on specific activities. So instead of saying that uh, just leaving it that this user is a manager, you would say this user is a manager, a manager is allowed to see reports, and for this particular action, you need to have the permission to see reports. Now, this often, however, is not enough. Uh, in fact, probably the most common type of uh, authentication, uh, authorization that you need is really by resource instance. Because the question is not really, is this user allowed to do a particular action in general, but rather is this user allowed to do a particular action with this particular resource, right? So because, I mean, if you think of an application like Facebook, I mean, everyone on Facebook is allowed to post messages, right? But or, or everyone on Facebook is allowed to, you know, update a profile picture, but only I am allowed to update my profile picture. So in that case, we have authorization that is very specifically bound to a resource. No, but then beyond that, there is also can often be, you know, oftentimes you actually will have a combination of this where you will say, okay, well, those users aren't allowed to do this at all. And then for those users, if you are allowed to say edit, then you will, which, what, what you're allowed to edit will depend on a specific resource. But finally, it's important to remember that there is really, it's, it's basically impossible, I think, to uh, reduce authorization to a really like, simple, you know, capture uh, all cases sort of system. So it, oftentimes you really need to go for very customized solutions. Now, so given that, what do you do? And this is my sort of main, the, the main advice. 
we need to think of a concept of bottleneck. Now, normally bottleneck, with, when we think about performance, bottleneck is a bad thing. But when it comes to security, bottleneck is a good thing. Now, this is a picture of the, uh, the uh, defense of uh, Greece by the, uh, uh, the King Leonidas uh, army against the invading uh, troops of Xerxes. I don't know if you heard this story. Right? So the story is that uh, the Persian army was coming into Greece, and the uh, story is very in the most extreme version. It's 300, sometimes people say a few thousand Greek troops, Spartan troops, under the leadership of King Leonidas, held them for several days right, against an army of 10,000. And how did they do that? Well, the answer is that they found that the, the, the passage into Greece involved a pass which was roughly the width of this room between a rock and the sea. Right? And so the 10,000 Persian troops had to pass through this width of roughly that um, you know, room. And the 300 or 3,000, depending on this version of the story, of Greek troops could actually hold them up, hold, uh, defend it for a few days. Right? Now, so in security, what does this mean in, in the context of, uh, of authorization? What you don't want to, so if people ask you, is this, if, if your application secure, what you want to make sure is that the answer to this question does not actually involve auditing all of your code. What you want to make sure is that you could say that, you know what, all I need to know to answer this question is to audit this function or this file. But it needs to be very, so the, how do I achieve that? Well, you, do, you achieve this by making sure that all of your requests essentially go through the same place where the authorization rules are enforced that you don't sprinkle them all over your code, right? So for instance, if each one of your uh, types of endpoints has its own, um, basically does its own Mongo logic, right? And before it does its own Mongo logic, it goes and it checks separately whether it should be doing this at all, and if so, whether it should actually be, what kind of information it should be returning and whatnot, right? So if you do that, then when you're wondering whether unauthorized users get to actually access things they shouldn't be doing, you have to go and check it in every single case. If all of this goes through a relatively centralized piece of code, you actually uh, have a fairly straightforward place where you can actually check what's going on. So now let me talk a little bit more, yet more specifically, and this is using a, um, I'll use as an example, a project that we've been working on and um, what it is, is um, Coast. So it's a project called Coast. And the Coast, I mean, you could think of it as a um, thin server fra uh, framework of sorts, where basically the idea is that oftentimes uh, we found in our uh, own work that we want to get started on the server side very quickly. I mean, so we, uh, Rengal.io, where I work, we are a full stack JavaScript uh, development uh, uh, firm. And what we want to do, uh, but a lot of the work that we do is really on the front end. We want to kind of get to the front end as soon as possible. And now one solution to this is people say, well, there's generators. You use Yeoman, and Yeoman generates a whole mean stack, uh, just, you know, pages worth of boilerplate for you. Uh, I mean, which is fine if this is going to be, one, if you're going to set this application up and you're going to be then working on it for three years, right? But for me, for if you're actually working on multiple projects, that becomes really a uh, nightmare. So this is, in a way, a way of trying to do that without resorting to boilerplate. So what we do here is that it's a, uh, it's a relatively simple server setup that kind of makes all of the uh, basic decisions for you, uh, the kind of things that pretty much we find all of our clients need. Now, um, and I'm not sort of talking about this to sort of to recommend that you guys all adopt this. I mean, you're welcome to, but I just want to use that as an example of how we handle authorization in this context so that you could actually sort of see what I'm talking about in, in, in practice. So the first idea here is, again, we're going to sort of go with this idea of bottleneck and, um, and look at the, at the server side. So on the server side, what we are going to do here is we are going to actually um, specify a, um, we're going to use, so we use a module called uh, uh, Mongo Mapper, which basically maps uh, HTTP requests onto uh, Mongo uh, requests, right, into actual Mongo queries. And one of the things we do here is we specify, um, so we basically specify the action, 
and the um, um, the endpoint, and then we specify the permission of what type of user is actually allowed to call this at all. And then finally, we actually call the mapper function, the handler function, which is sort of generated automatically, and we get to specify in it some of these sort of specific um, things that we expect, right? So, so, so this approach basically gives us already potentially uh, role-based or activity-based uh, authentication, where we can basically say that Anyone can get uh, robots, in this case, but only users with certain permissions are allowed to actually post to them. So, th and this, is, this is, ends up being sufficient for many applications, but not for all. What often is needed beyond that is, um, is a more specific restriction, right? Now, um, which can be used e not necessarily instead of, but in addition to, which is resource specific. So here, the way, the first step of defense that we provide is you specify a um, query decorator function, which basically will annotate every request with a, um, uh, with extra requirements. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're gonna say that um, every, for every query that we're gonna make, we're going to insist that the owner is equal, that there's a match that requires that owner be equal to username. Now what this would mean in practice, if we were to do it quite that bluntly, that no one will ever be able to get access to any objects that don't um, actually have uh, owner set to their username. Now this is probably a little too blunt, so this practically would not work usually, but the approach that often would work and uh, we found useful with some clients is the second one, which is a little bit more subtle. So here we're saying that we're going to go ahead and we're actually gonna annotate every object with a client ID. And um, every user will also have a client ID. And with this function in place, now no one will act, so we will at no point will we actually be making database queries with, that are not restricted to a specific uh, client. And the client would always be the client that the user is associated with. So this is, means that if your site is used by multiple organizations, you basically right there are preventing the possibility of ever showing one client's information to another. I mean, this is really nice because you can actually then sleep a lot better at night because the, your worst case scenario in this case now is that someone will see within an organization, will see the data from, from their organization that they weren't supposed to see. But you will never need to worry about person in one organization to seeing data from another organization. Now, um, so in, and notice that this, in this case, we actually end up taking care of this on, at pre-filter, uh, at, at, so at the pre-query um, point, right? So, so this data will not actually even be requested from the database. Now, at the other times we may want to do something more complicated uh, where we, we want to actually make a broader query but filter it on the way out, right? And so, and be, uh, this often would be the case where the filtering logic would be a bit more complicated, where we want to actually check a bunch of conditions and uh, to see that we are, um, whether the client really should be actually getting those objects back. So in this case we will, um, have a, um, so this is an example of filtering uh, method, which basically, uh, now in this case, notice as I said, the authorization, the actual authorization logic often needs to be customized. So in this case, the decision of what can see means and what can edit means is actually offloaded. So there's a function that you will need to write that will determine this. But what we are doing here is we just, basically for regardless of the type of request, we will go and filter them this way. No, and then finally, the important thing is that we want to inform the client about what the client is allowed to do. Now, the way we do it here is every response ends up coming in an envelope that has metadata that contains authorization information. Um, and um, in this case, we will use the same can edit function and we basically say that the uh, edit permission is going to get set depending on whether we decided that this particular, this particular user should be able to edit this particular resource. 
So now over to the client side. So we've done some work on the, on the server side, and the nice thing now is that on the client side, everything becomes fairly simple. So this is the way our application now ends up looking. Now this is Angular, um, but you don't need to obviously be using Angular to take this approach. Um, so we, um, our application um, requires Coast module, and then Coast gets injected as, uh, into the controller. And then um, we have, first of all, our first step is we actually give the user an option to log in, uh, where they specify provider, they specify whether they want to log in with Facebook or Twitter, and then we just offload this to the, uh, in this case, Coast Library to initiate OAuth authentication. Uh, notice that with, with Auth, we do end up essentially reloading the page afterwards, so we don't need to uh, sort of worry about what happens afterwards, because really, once authentication, OAuth authentication is initiated, as far as this life cycle of the application is concerned, we're kind of, it's over. We're gonna come back to life already authenticated. And, um, and then here's what we do afterwards, right? So we, we wait to find out what the user status is. We do that using promises. And when the user is uh, authenticated, so when we know whether the user is authenticated, we're gonna check if they are authenticated. And once we do that, then we get uh, a request a resource. Now, in this case, we actually offer a, a simple wrapper uh, around dollar HTTP, which basically will go ahead and look at the envelope, the, the permissions envelope, and basically add those things as methods to, uh, to, the, to the resource object. So consequently, what this means now is that, so what we do is we basically just got the list of robots from the server, which got passed through this client side um, wrapper. We attach it to the scope, and then what do we do in our template? Well, in our template, we just do this. So we just say that if uh, ng if robot.can.edit, then we show a button, and if not, then we don't. So now the nice thing about this approach is that Regardless of whether, so, so the decision of whether um, the user can actually make, ed do edits is done by the server, which is really the only place where you can actually make the decision authoritatively. But then this, the server basically communicates that information to the client. So the client knows what they are, so the client doesn't get to decide what the user is allowed to do, but the client knows what the user is allowed to do. So I will, um, well, thank you very much, and um, we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? Yeah? I mean, this particular, so like literally using this is, so, so this is sort of being collected out of some of the other products. So we've basically done this in a few different ways for different clients, and we've just sort of started collecting this into a reusable module um, recently, like in February. So we now have one, one project that's, that's about to launch that is actually using literally this. Like, I mean, you basically install uh, uh, Coast using NPM and uh, using Bower, and then you just go. Uh, so yes, yeah, so in that sense, one project about to be launched. Yeah. Um, you mean having the server essentially generate different HTML? No, good point. Yes, so it all becomes a little bit, I didn't talk about this deliberately because it does make it a little bit more complicated. So if you, if you start looking at server-side rendering now, so the thing is that server-side rendering is a kind of a tricky question because we've sort of kind of in a way gone both ways on this, right? I mean, we've sort of all started 
by, by generating HTML on the server, then we've gone to saying that, well, no, let's not generate HTML on the server. Let's do all of that stuff on the client. And now some people are saying that, well, we really don't want to go back to generating all of our HTML on the client, but we can't on the server, but we sort of, th there are times to do that, right? So if you want to, to do that, then this becomes a bit more complicated and some of this logic will be applied on the server side. Um, but I think that this, the way that most people built uh, single page applications today is really um, by basically not doing any uh, template processing on the server, right? Because I mean, short of core, I mean, it gains you a little bit of performance, but on the cleanliness of architecture, it just really things become so much simpler if you stop. Um, also, in a way, my advice would be that you kind of want to first go and actually go towards generating all HTML, so doing all template processing on the, on the client before you go back and reintroduce elements of uh, server-side template rendering. Yeah? Oh, no, that's, that's a great question. So the, you can, and that's the important thing, is that so this is why I, I said this is the, the authorization logic on the client is for courtesy. So which is to say that the server is, not, is going to block a request to edit. So now we, to be nice to the client, we are warning the client, we are informing the client about that by, by hiding the button. Now, if the client wants to go and actually do something to really show this button to themselves so they could click on it and get an error message from the server, well, knock yourself out, right? Uh, this is precisely why I'm saying that this is, this is a matter of courtesy. This is a matter of improving user experience. So, so all the authorization, the way I approach it is that all the authorization code on the client side is a matter of user experience. If the client wants to do something sneaky to destroy their own user experience, who are we to stop them? Yeah? Exactly. And the, and the, the clients who don't want to behave well, then, well, there is the bad, the, there's the bad cop server authentication, uh, authorization that's going to stop them. So that's what I'm saying. So in that sense, we don't need to worry about whether we are making mistakes in the client code because the only thing that's going to suffer from that is user experience, uh, which of course is not to be taken lightly. We don't need to worry about what the client is going to do because the only thing that's going to suffer is user experience. And because all of the decisions, all of the work of blocking the actual uh, inappropriate request, all of that work should be done by the server because that's the only piece of code that we can actually fully trust. it again? Which? This, or this particular project that we're working on? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So we actually originally um, jumped on, we originally wanted to implement it not in Express but in Core. Uh, and that's why we actually started with, as called it Coast. Uh, but then um, the support for um, we are six in Node has been sort of a little slow in coming, so we ended up this, deciding to basically do Express first and then add Core later. Now I'm not sure what other options you had in mind. I mean, that's I mean those would be the two options that I would seriously consider today. Yeah. So no. So it's it's right now only Express, but the plan is to actually move to Core as soon as that really becomes practical in uh, in, in production. Thank you very much.